I believe the world should have winners and losers. It doesn't feel good losing. I've lo I've been on both sides. I feel that losing and failure helps. Uh, you know, in school, we don't really get taught. People are scared to take risks in school because we're not really taught to fail. I never allowed accreditations to give me limitations. Investing for beginners 101. We go through different monetary cycles, right? And things change in those cycles, okay? so. When we could cut the gold off the gold standard, things changed massively since the, since the 70s, right? Now we're going through another one of those changes right now. We have these sort of paradigm shifts that we go through just based on money changes, money evolves, and that's just what it is. If you really want to grow and you want a life over and above the average one, then you do need to take risks. And one of the biggest things for me, and is a question that I really wish I was asked, was, Welcome back, everybody, to the Success School podcast. I am your host and compare, Matt Hall. And as always, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here, whether you be listening on the podcast or indeed watching on the YouTube channel. You are massively appreciated. Today's guest is the fantastic Mr. D. Ludlow. D is an investor and he's also the founder of the 5am club. And this is going to be a great episode for you if you are somebody that's maybe in business um, and are wanting to learn a little bit more about investing, things like cryptocurrency um, and just general kind of, as I say in the podcast, like investing 101 tips. If, if investments are something that you know you want to get more into, but you're very new to it, this is going to be a great little introduction for you. But that's not all. There's a lot that we speak about in this podcast that is super inspiring, motivational. We talk about Dee's kind of story. Um, so I'm sure that whoever you are, there's going to be something in this podcast episode for you. If this is the first time listening or joining us on this podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could stick around and not just watch this one episode, but if you could hit that subscribe button wherever you are consuming this podcast, um, it would be great for you to become a regular listener if you take value from this podcast. But without further ado, please enjoy this is D Ludlow. What was your background like? And ultimately, what was the journey that led you to where you are now, which is, you know, with the 5am club and an investor? So my dad was in financial services. So I always had a, a bit, you know, that was always around me. Um, but I sort of resisted that sort of pathway. You know, um, uh, I did when I first left school, um, I start to learn the sort of uh, the CMAT to go into be a mortgage advisor, but it sort of wasn't for me. I was into other things. And then I sort of went down my own route, made tons of mistakes. I mean, ridiculous amounts of mistakes um, to the point where some of the mistakes, I don't know, you feel like sometimes you can't come back from some of the mistakes, but you do you just keep going, um, stay consistent. And then through those mistakes, I learned. And then I realized that it doesn't feel good. I've always been into like sport too. So I feel sport helps you be competitive. And um, I've always been very competitive. And I always, there's, I know we're sort of going through this um, period now where everyone gets a trophy sort of mindset. And I believe the world should have winners and losers. It doesn't feel good losing. I've, I've been on both sides. And um, I feel that losing and failure helps. And uh, you know, in school, we don't really get taught about the whole, people are scared to take risks in school because we, 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 we're we not really taught to fail. Um, or if they, we don't need that, they don't want us to fail, right? Well, you know, you, if you get bad results on an exam, you look down upon more than, you know, this, of course you get encouraged. I'm not saying it's all bad, but point is you need to be the A-star student. And that was never me. I wasn't very good at exams. Um, a lot of the stuff that I learned was from physically doing it and learning through mistakes. So from there, I sort of went into business um, and I was always fascinated then by the financial market. So for me, I was looking at, right, where, where's the money made in the world? Um, you know, I, I want a good life. <laughs> um, so how, how can I get it? And I always noticed that business and property were the two things that I was like, this is where the wealth seems to be at. Um, the difference was um, for me back then, business, there's no ceiling. So, you know, is unlimited amounts of growth. So even if you hit a ceiling and a, a capacity in one business, 
you can then acquire another and scale through acquisition or you can expand and grow so i was like there's an unlimited roi in business so i need to focus on this first and then i sort of did a lot of that also invest at the same time because i followed a lot of stuff on like you know um ray dalio Warren buffett and sort of a lot of like bill ackerman a lot of the investors and i seen what they was doing i was always fascinated by the sort of the compound effect as well um so yeah i sort of went on a crash course of learning about investment um for a long time and then i started going down the course route i paid it for a lot of courses because again like i i enjoy reading books but at the same time i'm like at the speed i'm like i, I i'm sure there's a quicker way than this i'm not saying that you need to go take fast the 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 quick money because that's not what i was looking for and trust me that there is no quick money i've tried everything doesn't work a lot of it <laughs> um but you know i um i wanted a fast track and I want a guidance. So I want to look for the people that were actually doing it. I paid them and I felt like I acquired the knowledge a lot quicker. And, um, and then from there being quite ambitious as I am, I just, yeah, sort of went and run with it. And over time, yeah, just sort of ended up here somehow. <laughs> yeah. A lot of pain was involved though. <laughs> but yeah, we're here. <laughs> I want to touch upon that because you, you spoke there about failure and a lot of us when we're, studying self-development and successful people you hear it all the time like failure is actually an integral part of success right can you think of what was the biggest perceived failure and potentially the most important the one that probably hit me the most was i i, I had a um we started off with meal prep business right so we was um basically pushing a lot of meal prep out on a week to week basis. And we was growing quickly and we managed to basically partner with one of basically the largest shopping center owner in the UK. And they basically opened the doors to us. And they was like, look, you can go in 16 major shopping centers around the UK. We like the idea. We like the branding. We like what you've done. Um, but I knew that we didn't have the right team at the time. So it was me and a friend. It was three of us to start, or two of us to start, one left, another guy come on board. And then we was like, we, we don't have the right infrastructure in regards to team to take this where we need to go. So we took another director on board um, just to operate and manage the kitchen because that's not our skill set, right? <laughs> um, I'm the greatest cook in the world. Um, I didn't want to manage a kitchen either. So, um, and I believe massively in outsourcing and, and delegating, and especially to grow, you need to do that and put trust in team. So um, we brought another director on board that was a chef um, and we didn't really see eye to eye. But we had no choice to scale. Like, it was a pretty bad business decision at the time. Um, didn't do a hell of a lot of due diligence on the person, but enough to be to warrant them like, look, they're, they're a reputable person. You know, they've done stuff in the past and good background, um, a lot older than us. And yeah, things we we opened up initially in uh, Cardiff, St. David's Shopping Centre in Cardiff. Um, it's like the biggest shopping centre in Wales. Um, and we was working quite close with the management team and the senior management team. And things went horribly wrong. I started to go downhill, um, which was very frustrating because of the, the, the sort of the where the potential it had and i know in business optimism is something that in every start that people have we get very optimistic we start to think that our product or service is better than the entire marketplace and you know we just have this we do need to be optimistic to grow i understand but we get a bit of delusion in the optimism and just because we 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 get emotionally attached to an idea and then what usually happens in business especially in this in like a startup is um optimism gets punched in the face by realism um, quite quickly and you have to try and adapt because then you start to realize you know that the momentum you get for the first couple of months is something new so people gravitate towards it like this is cool you can make yourself look really good for social media if branding's on point and photography's on point video videography's on point people are like this is amazing and we had all that so um you know and yeah things started to go wrong unfortunately we got hit in the face by realism, start to realize, look, this is going to be a lot harder than we expect. And it was, it was a shame because in the end, we had no choice but to basically hang the gloves up. A lot went on. It was like, it's like legal stuff that went on in the end that people didn't follow through with their roles and responsibilities. 
um, yeah, things went wrong. People started taking things they shouldn't have. And yeah, it was, um, it was, it was disastrous to be fair. And it was one of those things where it was like, where do I go from here? Like I literally, I fully committed to that, that, that whole business. And I felt more sure about that than anything. And the annoying thing was it was out of my hands. It was the wrong team and a few bad decisions was yeah major consequences from a few bad decisions by rushing and trying to be first to market and that that was the problem is we live in that world now where people want to be first with, with no plan and they think look we'll just get it done and look i i, I i'm all for like the the big mindset people in the, the space grant cardone etc but the whole just do it and then figure it out later yeah if, look if you 80 percent there that's me that's my personality because i'm a driver but like if you're 20 percent there it doesn't that doesn't work so it, there's a lot of reality behind it and unfortunately preparation will always be key but on the flip side i feel that you you don't need to prep too much because some people um one of the things that happened previously a good friend of mine i think i'll use this story because i think it'll be beneficial um a friend of mine came to me with a business plan um it looked great yeah it was like 20 30 pages of a business plan right? I've, I've never done that in my life right and i was like it was insanely detailed and it looked great and i said oh so what's the plan now what, when, when are you uh going to market with this and he's like, oh, i need to do a little bit more research on it and i was like no no you, you're over planning like there's a difference in preparation and then over planning and not pulling the trigger so it was a bit of a balance between those two which was very hard things went wrong and unfortunately it was one of those things where you know it's out of your control you either roll over or you basically carry on and understand this is part of the game and you you have to take risks to grow unfortunately and that you know you can mitigate your risk and you can have great risk management to a certain extent but there will always be some exterior force that comes in that a lot of the time you have no control over and that's just part of adapting in business unfortunately so learning lessons from that period now as you make decisions today what are some of the maybe pointers or benchmarks that you look for to try and get that balance now so i try not to focus on balance too much anymore um because i felt like i feel like we now more than ever in history um, especially in the Western world, I feel that we, I'll use the Western world because I'm just going to say like the UK, US, Canada, Australia, I feel that we put psychological walls up and we label everything. We have to try and find a label for everything. And I feel that we create limitations ourselves. And so for me, it was more of a case of, you know, instead of saying, oh, this went wrong because of this, or I need to balance this and balance this. If I focus too much on balance, I, I feel... I'm going to be unproductive. So I agree that, you know, if you, if you don't have some sort of balance, whatever that is, then you're going to burn out. You get, you, you do need to have a balance, but I don't know what balance is. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I've done 18 hour days. You know, I frequently still to this day will do 10 to 12 hours with breaks because I enjoy it. I, I actually enjoy what I do. So for me, um, when it comes to balance, it's like, well, what would you class as balance or work-life balance? And people's like, well, have some time away from work and go and do something you enjoy. And it's like, well, what if I enjoy work? I actually enjoy it. So where you guys might want to go down the pub or go and do something else, like if I had a choice, I'd probably just do this because I like it. So I feel that balance is another one of those labels. And I'm not saying it's not needed, but if I say to you, right, like, look, what's a balanced diet? I could probably ask every single person on the call and everyone will give us a different opinion what a, actually a balanced diet is mainly you'll say oh you know so make sure you eat clean bit of salad this and that bit of balance you, you, you can generally have some common sense on it but to find the true balanced diet you could probably ask the, the most knowledgeable nutritionist in the world and someone else will still have a different opinion so i feel like bad we try and label everything work-life balance balance this it's just like look why can't we just live <laughs> What, why have we got to label everything? And a lot of the stuff that we do day to day, we put psychological walls up. You know, we can't do this because of this. You know, if, if it was, if, if we had control over a lot of stuff, like let's use boxers, for instance. Can you imagine a boxer going into a ring and they're like, today you're going to fight someone with three weight classes bigger than you. And they're like, well, that's not fair. And then instantly that, like, yeah, but they're bigger, they're stronger, they're this, they're this, they're this. It's like, well, so 
if all the conditions are exactly how you want them, you can win. But if the conditions aren't, you can't. It's like if everybody thought like that, then how would anyone find some sort of success? And everyone defines success differently. So it's very hard to describe what real success is because everyone has it differently. But, you know, if we have to keep putting all these things and all the stars needs to align for us to get something done, that's not the world we live in. That's, it, that doesn't work. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. No matter how much preparation, research, due diligence, hard work, sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, to me, you know how I feel about it anyway, Matt. Well, I feel that if you can just stay consistent and disciplined for a long period of time, whatever it is you want to do, will at some point you will find some sort of success in it. But, and, and it's the one thing that no one's willing, not no one, a lot of people aren't willing to do that. Wake up every day, when things are definitely not going right for you and a week goes by, a month goes by, nothing's changing. For the person that still gets up in the second month and still carries on doing what they're doing, I fully admire that person because that's hard. When things ain't going your way and you keep getting up, that, to me, that's true discipline, consistency, and at some point you, you'll get rewarded if, if you do that. And just, to, just before we move on, one of the things for me, I feel that, because I wasn't like the most academic in school. Like now I love a lot, a lot of the stuff I read and stuff I do now. I was never like that in school. I, I feel like I've grown into it. I was probably too immature at the time in school. People mature quicker than others. Um, but I never allowed accreditations to give me limitations. You know, I feel that, you know, in, in this world again, you know, especially I feel like it's changing slightly now, generational changes. But, you know, when I was in school, my mum could never understand, you know, D, you need to go to university, you need to do this. Um, your friend is going to university and he's becoming a lawyer. This person's doing this. And I felt like at the time, my mum wasn't doing anything wrong because that's what she thought was right. But in my mind, I'm like, am I falling behind because they're doing this? When no, people just take different pathways. And, you know, how you, I'm not saying you don't want to compare success now, but my point is if I listened and did that, some of the things that I've done now, I probably would never have done because I would have followed what everyone else was doing. And I feel that even if you follow someone completely, you'll, there'll be a different result. Me and you could do the exact same thing, go down the same pathway, same place, same time, and something will be different. And it's because we're all different people and we take bits of success from different people and we, we decide what works for us because we're different. So yeah, that's, that's why I feel about it. And I couldn't agree more. I absolutely love that. I'm interested as well, because one thing that I'm obsessed about, and I know you are, is psychology, mindset, and there's a lot of stuff you've spoken about today already, about you've always been competitive, you've always been ambitious. You also spoke uh, you know, about, which I completely agree with, this day and age we're living in where you can get a trophy for finishing last, just for showing up. And I don't think that's necessarily healthy. From a psychology standpoint, do you think that ambition, that competitiveness that you had in sports and have taken on in life and everything, was that something that you have just been born with or do you think it's a learned behaviour? And if so, where do you think that's come from? I'm not actually sure. Um, I've always been competitive, but in some of the sports I did when I was like a kid, like I was in sports since I was like six years old, like football, but I wasn't the best player. Like I was far from the best player. So it's, and I kind of accepted it when I was younger that I weren't the best player, you know? So when I went to other sports, I just, I don't know where it came from. I just had this real competitive edge that I wanted to win and I, at everything. I, I, it, it, no matter what it was, I would take it serious. Can, can you I'm literally sure, remember a time where you didn't view things like that? Yeah, like when I, I think when I was like, probably under 10 years old I think it was after 10 11 like probably comprehensive I started to really get a little bit more competitive and I'm not sure whether you naturally meet other children from other schools don't you and you like merge and it's a little bit different I'm not sure whether that was the trigger um but yeah I, I, I'm not sure before I was like 10 I'd be competitive maybe on computer games but like realistically like sport wise I like I played football and I wasn't the best so for me it's like well I wasn't really competitive because I accepted that I wasn't the best and I didn't try to be better where I see some kids really working even now. Like, you know, I, I took the kids down the field the other day. Um, we were just playing Frisbee and messing around and there was a young kid and he was like, had some little thing. He's practicing some football skills and the kid was like eight, nine years old down there on his own and he was doing drills. And like, for me, 
I was like, that's insane. Like that, like that takes true discipline for a young kid to do that. And I admire that because I definitely didn't have that discipline back then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know there's a lot of members that are in success school that have been working on personal development, maybe working on building side hustles, building businesses, multiple streams of incomes and so on. And we hear a lot about, you know, from these gurus and influencers on Instagram and Facebook and so on telling us that, you know, the best thing to do with our money is um, investing in appreciating assets. You know, there's been a lot said over the years about property being one of the best things, gold. We're now hearing a lot about crypto. We're now seeing property and the house market is really high. We know crypto is volatile. Then there's these things called NFTs. Everybody's like, what's that? We're hearing everybody saying the worst thing to do for your money is to keep it in the bank. And I think for a lot of people, like, we've touched upon it you know traditional education doesn't teach us any of this so we go through life we get a job and we're just trying to do our best to get through and make ends meet and then next minute we're being told from every angle you don't want your money in your bank and we were like well we were told to save for a rainy day and put it in the bank so really for people that are at that stage i want us to almost do investing for beginners 101 and start with for you, if somebody's at that stage, where do you think they need to start in terms of where to look, what to be considering, and really where's to get the right advice? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I'm someone that's like, I'm very realistic with this stuff, right? Um, the, the, because there's good and bad in every asset, right? Regardless of how you look at it, I, I do see a lot of confirmation bias online, and I don't want to get started on social media because there are a lot of people that literally do not do what they what they what they're really promoting so it frustrates me a lot and i feel that people don't share both sides they only share the one side they look for the bias and they run with the bias right regardless of what the media produces this is for property crypto all of it regardless of what it is they find the bias to suit their narrative so i think to start with um understanding your personal risk appetite and time horizon super boring but once you get those two things right you can decide what assets suit you, right? Now, risk appetite is how big of a risk tolerance do you have and how exposed would you like to be to an asset class? So for instance, if you used to go and buy a property and let's say you didn't do like the rent to rent stuff that Sean does, or you didn't do BRR, you was just like, look, I want to buy to let just something I can rent out. I don't want to do it any other way. I'm going to go down the traditional route of a 25% mortgage, right? If you were to do that, then you're like, look, I'm levered up at 75%. If the housing market dips 25%, then the bank potentially could call my loan in, loan in but it's very unlikely. So your risk, your risk appetite can be very low and you should be okay in that scenario. Now, I'm saying should because who knows, right? We don't really know. We're moving into uncharted waters right now, right? Um, in the current um, economic outlook. Now, same as crypto, right? If you used to say, look, I'm going to put a small amount of money into Bitcoin and my time horizon is 10 or 20 years, again, you should be okay. Again, we don't know what's going to happen long term. Regardless of forecasts and predictions, no one knows, right? <laughs> Things change, okay? Now, just to give you a bit of an insight and background on property, for instance, because it's probably the one asset that everybody feels safe in, right? Now, pre the 70s, right? Pre the 50s, it was completely flat. Literally, there were pretty much no growth in the property market. So if anyone says to you, um, property doubles every 10 or 12 years, they're going to show you a chart after the 70s, because that's when the home ownership mortgage was started to be promoted. And then if you look at a property chart from the 70s to now, it's gone absolutely parabolic. Because and the reason why is because as soon as you give people access to credit, people can leverage. And that's what that's what stimulates growth, which is why I've been a very growth sort of centered economy for a long period of time, which is great for all of us who invest, right? Um, and then if you look at, for instance, cryptocurrency, yeah, if you look at a Bitcoin chart from even two, three years ago, yeah, it's like no matter what happens today, if you invest a few years ago, you'd be okay. But for both of those, that doesn't mean to say they're both going to be good long term. I think I feel safe in both of them long term. But again, that's my risk appetite, right? That doesn't mean it's for everybody. Um, and then time horizon is a big one. Because 
with property, you have you put sort of forced into a long term time horizon because you can benefit from cash flow and capital appreciation, right? Now, of course, if you do flips or you do like you know ground up developments to sell, then of course your time horizon is going to be slightly it's going to be less because your exits um, a lot quicker. So time horizon usually is a big thing because you know it's how long you're willing to sit in a market for. Um, and there isn't any asset really you should take a real short time horizon to, in my opinion, because invest, if you want to take a short term time horizon, then you need to trade. And that goes for property, crypto, stocks. You, you need to go into trading if that's what you want to do. And again, very vol you're looking at volatility in the market then, right? And you, you, you actually enjoy vo volatility where a long term investor pays no attention to volatility and they don't look at short term price action in anything. So people that buy property today, and you could argue is very toppy and you know property markets gone crazy right and being propped up or whatever however people want to dress it up you know people that are investing for the next 25 years probably don't care if the property market dips today they're like i'm in this for the long term and but we also got to understand there are times when markets are flat for a long time right um and so that's another thing so regardless of what asset you invest in just because markets have only always gone up in our lifetime doesn't mean they're only always going to go up it, you know it, that's that's not certain um stocks is another one you know and the reason why i'm breaking these down is because i know a lot of the stuff on these online so people say you know dollar cost average and into an index fund and i don't know they say like by the time i know in 50 years you'll be a millionaire or some silly stuff like that right because they're relying on the market compounding at eight to ten percent per year now yeah of course if that happens then over time the compound the compound effect and compound interest is great but that's relying on the market doing that, right? So we're going to speculate that the market will do that because historically it looks like it's done that. But unfortunately, even though historical data is uncertain, people do say, look, it rhymes pretty well. But again, we go through different monetary cycles, right? And the different monetary cycles we've gone through, things change in those cycles, okay? So I don't want to go too deep into sort of a macro macroeconomic history but even like when we could took the gold off the gold standard things changed massively since the, since the 70s right now we're going through another one of those changes right that right now we have these sort of paradigm shifts that we go through just based on money changes money evolves and that's just what it is so with crypto time horizons massive i see so many people that were like i'm going to make some money in this bull run and then i'm going to take it out i'm going to go and buy a house so i'm going to go and do this and then the they're trying to time markets and unfortunately there's no one smart enough in the world to time markets and get it right every time we speculate on this so the the thing I, the reason why i'm covering all that is because as an investor we invest into something hoping that it's going to be worth more when we sell that's that's what we do we speculate on the investment and there's certain things that we can do to mitigate risks and how we approach it but nobody actually knows. We can look at technical analysis. We can look at fundamental analysis. We can do look at all the metrics. It still doesn't mean that we're going to be right. And with risk appetite and time horizon, if you don't understand your risk appetite and time horizon and you invest in something, the asset itself will end up showing you what your risk appetite and time horizon is. What I mean by that is less crypto is the easiest. Like you could go into something in crypto, so volatile, something goes terribly wrong within a week straight away you understand that your risk appetite wasn't as big as you thought it was right and your time horizon was definitely longer than you anticipated and same like property if imagine you bought um a you know some land today you've got some planning to do ground development you took millions of pounds in development finance and then next week something goes really terribly wrong rates go up i don't know two three hundred basis points or whatever something really crazy a black swan event that would never happen and then all of a sudden credit lines freeze up and you're like, wow. So now I've got a couple of million pounds in development finance I got to pay for and I can't get materials. I can't get no additional lending, can't get people to work. So things happen again, out of our control. So I think, and I don't want to go too doomsday on this, but I want people to understand that the risks of investing, because as great as it looks online, there are risks associated with it, regardless of how you dress it up. And one of the things, one of the things that I say is like, you know, you, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And the, the, the reason why I say that is because people dress all these things up and make them look so fancy. And like I said, you can make it look as good as you can, but it doesn't mean it's right. So like for me, you know, I'm mainly focused on like income. So for me, 
it's great to be an investor and um, you know look for capital appreciation long term and it's a very good strategy to take a long term time horizon to dollar cost average into something whether it's an index fund cryptocurrency like depending on which ones um, and property as well like you know buy pieces of real estate as and when you can but first and foremost to do any of that you need good income and cash flow regardless of what anyone tells you if you have a pot of money and you're like look uh, let's say it's 100k right once you've invested the 100k you can't recycle it if you can't um, and even if you recycle it, it only goes so far eventually it runs out and then you or you got whatever you've bought you're just relying on that to give you either cash flow or you're waiting for some sort of capital growth right whereas if you can generate income from an investment then you have an opportunity to grow the income to then reinvest and then you reinvest in profits that you've either grown through a company or you've acquired from a company so for me the reason why i focus predominantly on buying businesses is because for me instead of buying property i'm buying a business so let's say property for instance i was heavily involved in property pre-covid um so you know let's say i use wales because that's where i was investing right a three-bed house in wales back then like up in the valleys you, you could get something for like 50k right we you know literally almost every deal we was doing was a pretty much all money out deal so you know i had a great estate agent that was finding them for me now you know we pull all the money out plus like another 10 or 20k out of some of these deals which you know once you're pulling that money out it's a loan so it's tax-free so it's great right getting paid to own these these properties now let's say you didn't pull no money out you must manage to pull all your initial money out you're going to be left with two or three hundred quid a month cash flow coming in if you're lucky 400 right but you've had to utilize like 50k initially as a down payment plus your legal costs, stamp duty, and then and then any refurb costs, right? So you're probably in the in, in the money for like 75k. To, and even if you can pull it back out, great, infinite ROI. However, you've got two or three hundred quid a month. So I imagine I take that 75k and then I leverage the same sort of leverage, some sort of finance from uh, a private lender or even even a commercial lender, um, traditional lender. Um, and I could acquire a business. Now for that 75K, I, I know I could comfortably acquire something that's gonna, like, I mean, comfortably, th something that's throwing out 150 grand a year net every single year. Like, so the difference is now, that 75K is gonna give me 150 grand a year extra, right? Opposed to 400 quid a month, right? That's the difference. And then the, the great thing with business, like I said, there's no ceilings. You can continue to either scale or reinvest some money and keep growing the business. So that's what I like. It. And then if you want to invest in property, you've now turned your 75 into 150 per year. And you can still diversify the property through profits. Now, another thing I want to touch on quickly is passive income, right? So uh, we, we hear this and it's the easiest way to sell courses. People talk about passive income into financial freedom. This is the, the main selling point for most of these courses. And, you know, I bought those courses. A few years ago, I bought the same courses, right? The difference is a lot of the stuff that's, deemed as passive income isn't actually passive it's passive ish like if you want to go down the real passive income route then you want to go and buy like a care home suite so you can buy these little care home suites for 80 to 100k they'll give you a guaranteed 12 percent yield and some of them will even give you an option to sell it for a little bit more than you bought before in a few years time and literally you don't know who's staying in the care home the care home takes care of it that's passive income right passive income is not renting and house out to a tenant and every time something goes wrong, the manager calls you and sometimes you've got to get involved. That's passive-ish income because sometimes you've got to get involved. And take it from me, I don't like spending any time on my property portfolio. However, there's times I have no choice. You know, over the last year, I've had tenants that there's, there's, have not paid for over a year and there's nothing I could do. Like, I'm, I'm going to get involved or it's going to play on my mind. Like, it's not, so that with the passive income, regardless of what people tell you, tells you, there is passive income out there to a certain extent but it's hard and 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 the the risk you take is in line with the reward you get so if you're willing to take a bigger risk the reward's probably going to be bigger right however the downside is also bigger so you know if you want to go all in on one of these nfts like you said then like right now imagine you went and spent i don't know a million quid on a board ape one of the the pictures of the apes right and you you're holding one of those apes now in an illiquid market that we're in right now that in my opinion, you've got to go and find somebody stupid enough to give you uh, the same money back for that picture of a JPEG. And, and, and unfortunately, we've seen a lot of these crypto platforms go down right now and they're freezing withdrawals. So people can't even take their money off the platform. Now, my argument on NFTs are if OpenSea goes offline, where's the NFT? 
who owns the NFT if OpenSea goes down, or are they even on the blockchain? So for me, it's like, look, you can speculate and you can enjoy things when we're in a bull market and things are going well, but you also need to understand risk management and if things go wrong, how exposed you and how you're going to feel if they go wrong. Because when things are going right, no one thinks of what, what would I feel like if they go wrong. And the problem is with the bull market, anyone on here who's invested in crypto, you know, everyone gets into the routine, even myself, you know, like I'm looking, you, you open your block folio every day, you, you, you swipe down and you like seeing those unrealized gains that look good. They look good when it's going up every day. But the, the, the big word there is unrealized gains. Until you realize the profits, all it is is a picture on a screen, which tells you, you it looks like you got money. And it's the same with property. People say, oh, I've got a 10 million pound equity in my portfolio. I'm like, that's fantastic. Like to get to that level is amazing. But, you know, and don't get me wrong, property slightly different because you can like refinance and keep pulling money out. But of course, that equity is in the deal. So it's not in your bank, right? So, you know, th there's a difference. Same as stocks. People can have hundreds of thousands or millions in stocks, right? So you sell the stock, it's unrealized profits. You know, we've seen what happened recently. If anyone follows financial markets, PayPal has literally corrected down to its 2015 level. You know, Netflix has fallen off a cliff. Amazon's had a bit of a battery. You know, we're looking at some real solid companies that, you know, some of them are more volatile than Bitcoin. <laughs> and, you know, so as much as the media tries to run down Bitcoin, it's like, well, look, take a look at some of those publicly traded companies that everybody uses on a day-to-day -day basis. So I feel that, um, and one other thing, if you are looking to invest, whatever anyone, whatever anyone says in regards to like financial markets, like CNBC, Bloomberg, or anything you see in the news, don't watch that watch what they do, not what they say. It's very different, right? And the reason why I say that is because we've seen a lot of banks speak out and run down Bitcoin, run down Ethereum, run down all these cryptocurrencies, and the same banks are offering it to their high net worth individuals. The same banks are buying it, right? So you, you've got to be really open-minded to a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And unfortunately, at that sort of level, yeah, there's a thing called... Um, dark pool trading so it's like interbank trading that can be done after hours so and we don't get to see that like there is platforms now that you can pay to see it but you know we're just retail we're not going to move market so you got to definitely understand your personal risk appetite and time horizon regardless of what asset class you invest in i'm interested with all that in mind and the years experience you've got today what are some of the key principles that you live by and swear by when it comes to investing? What's your general strategy? What are you looking for? And what do you feel right now are good investments? So obviously this isn't financial advice, <laughs> but um, yeah. So key principles for me are the two boring ones, risk, appetite, time horizon. If, I, if I'm going to invest in anything, they're the two things I completely focus on because that's what's going to allow me to sleep at night right? No one wants to invest in something and not be able to sleep at night because of they've invested in it, right? So that's my two core principles. Um, second part was my, my strategy and focus. So my main strategy right now is just um, build a group. So keep acquiring businesses, build a group of businesses over a five to seven year time horizon. A lot of people do try and do it in like three, which you can. But again, um, for me, like things take longer. Like, you know things come up so i'm like look i'm happy to wait five to seven years and then i want to sell that group of businesses for you know a, a heavily increased multiple for what i bought them for while consolidating a lot of them resources bringing them into like a centralized hub make them as automated as possible to make them appealing to maybe someone from a private equity group or family office to come and acquire now over that time horizon i'm going to be using the profits to then invest in assets so my sort of investment portfolio grows through profits of something I've, I've acquired for not nothing, but close to no money down, if not no money down. Because of course you can do a lot. We've done deals in our group that are completely no money down. Some other people have done them too in the group. Um, so that's my main plan. The things I'm looking at now in regards to investments, like I said, not financial advice for me, um, Bitcoin, I'll always cost average into Bitcoin, whether it's, you know, 20,000 today, 15,000 next week, 10,000, 5,000 the week after, I'm really not bothered. My, my time horizon, of course, 
you're not going to like it, but my time horizon is cost averaging to Bitcoin over a long period of time, um, 10 years. I'm quite confident it's going to be worth a hell of a lot more than it is today. Um, obviously, I'm quite invested in other cryptocurrencies too. Um, you know, not as confident on a lot of those just because of what we've seen currently. Um, I do feel like, I'm not sure how knowledgeable people are on crypto here, but the sort of decentralized finance space, like, like Ethereum, for instance, I'm sure many of you have heard of Ethereum. Um, a lot of that stuff's quite Ponzi-like. So a lot of crypto investors that are only crypto, they tell everyone to, you know, get their money at the banks, like middle finger up to traditional finance, move to decentralized finance, bank yourself and all this. The problem is a lot of the DeFi stuff is now a bigger Ponzi than our traditional system. So you've got to be careful. Now, I, I agree with a lot of what they say is in like, look, the second you deposit your money into a UK bank, the bank becomes a legal owner. You know, that, that's, that's fact, right? And UK banks can put capital controls in place so they can freeze withdrawals, they can take your money, they can do that. But we've now seen that centralized platforms in crypto do the same thing. So as, like you can go down the rabbit hole as big as you want, but they can do it on both sides. So I do look at DeFi as well, but I'm very skeptical on DeFi at the moment. I don't invest in NFTs, um, but predominantly for me right now, I'm not looking at the financial markets. Uh, I feel like they're very rocky, um, but predominantly just business and Bitcoin for me at the moment. And when I feel the time's right, um, I'll be looking at property again. And, you know, I do see all the posts of uh, the best time to, to buy properties yesterday and the second best times today, but I don't agree with that. So um, I do believe that you can't time markets, but you can be sensible. And that's, that's just my opinion, but it doesn't mean it's right. It just means that's my risk appetite. So, yeah. Well, good, because you've confirmed what I was thinking on that one. So that was yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm going to start to wrap this up because obviously I want to make time for our members' um, questions. But just before we do, final couple of questions um, that I'm going to be asking all guests at Success School. The next question is, what are the three main lessons that you've learned that school never taught you? Myself, yeah. Um, probably the stuff we talked at the start. So one, so accreditations, um, don't let accreditations create limitations. That's the main one. Another one is um, taking risks. Of, of course, calculated risks, but if you really want to grow and you want a life over and above the average one, then you do need to take risks. And one of the biggest things for me, and is a question that I really wish I was asked, was um, was two questions. The one would be, what do you want to be? Oh, sorry, so the first one would be, what do you want your life to look like? And you know, if you asked me when I was 14 years old, 15 years old, of course, I was like, well, I want the cars, I want this, I want all these different things. And then the second question would be, okay, so what, what do you want to be? Like, what, what subjects are you taking and why? And then my, my answer to that back then would have been, I want to be a PE teacher because it's the only class I really enjoyed. So if someone asked me, okay, now the third, the third thing I, I, I wish someone said to me, if I said that, so I want this crazy life where I can travel the world, do all these fancy things, and I want to be a PE teacher. If the, the third question come to me and said, okay, go on Google, or back then it probably would have been Yahoo or whatever, um, go and Google the ceiling, the ceiling salary in the UK that a PE teacher can make. And then if I came back and that same person said to me, does that salary align with the life that you just said? And I would have quickly worked out no. And if I worked that out there and then, then maybe what I chose to do would have been very different. The problem is we get asked to pick these subjects at 15 years old or 14 years old, and no one really has a clue what they do. Some, some of us do, but very rarely the people end up doing the thing they do. And the people that do, I completely admire them because that's, that's literally crazy that you, the conviction in that's insane. But for me, I've gone down so many different paths. Like I can't, like the, the subjects I took has done nothing for me because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So for me, if someone asked you what well, the ceiling is, the ceiling salary is and the thing that you're doing currently or the thing that you want to do, if that doesn't align with the life you want, then you need to make a change instantly. So they're probably the main things that um, I probably learned from school. That was absolute 
power. And I think just I was just thinking about it then, like how many people would that change the entire trajectory of their life if they got asked that at 14? Like, actually, what do you want your life to look like? Not just what subject you want to study and what, what do you enjoy the most right now? No, what would you like your future life to look like? And make sure it's aligned with that. I think that's absolutely beautiful. Dee, I just want to acknowledge you because you've been so open um, and you, I'm sure, and we'll get onto the members in a second, but I'm sure they'll agree, like you've shared so much value tonight already. Um, just before we go into the final question, if people want to find out more about you, if they want to connect with you, and I know you said you're potentially going to give us a, a bit of a giveaway prematurely tonight. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about where they can find you and what it is you have available? Yeah, so mainly just Instagram is probably the easiest place, um, at D, D underscore Ludlow. I know Matt uh, shared it earlier today, but that's the main place. You can go to dludlow.com if you if you want to have a little look at some of the stuff that I do. Let me just quickly make sure I've got a domain, Matt, because... Uh, that's, how, that's how early we are. We yeah, don't, it is. It's not like, live yet. The, the, only, the only people that actually have seen this is my actual group, and they only seen it like two days ago. So it's just basically a, it's like a seven-step sort of guide into... Um, I big, big believe in optimizing performance and, you know, performing at the highest level. Um, I feel that we put a lot of, like, again, limitations and labels in front of us that we can't do certain things. So as a, if seven steps, first few goes through optimizing performance and clearing distractions and procrastination and all the other stuff. And then it goes into like a lot on like cash flow and investing and, and sort of the growth in that side. So it's just like seven steps, um, seven videos. There's the link just found it <laughs> that's how early it is because i literally didn't know the link but um, if anyone wants it it's free just click on it you can literally type your email address in and you get access to the video straight away and it's like seven videos really so yeah amazing brilliant the final question what is your definition of success um it's changed a lot um it's like two for me so i got three little girls so for me you know, obviously I want them to have, for me, I think traveling is massive, right? So traveling to me is like most important thing in my life. I feel that you understand culture and people a lot more if you travel. And I, I, I've, I'm massive on travel. I think people should do more of it if they can. Um, so I wanted them to see the world. I want to go to different places and I don't want no limitations on it. So that for me, success to me is to, for that to play out exactly how I have it in my head. Um, but I suppose people have like monetary goals and stuff like that as well, which for me, I'm someone I just want to see how far I can take it. Um, but I don't know one number I will feel like true success at. But one thing I will say is I, I'm grateful every day. And before January 2021, I literally did not practice gratitude. I thought it was one of these things that people just talk about. And I was like, whatever, what was that? And honestly, ever since I've started doing that, like, I'm one of them people who's like, you should practice gratitude. I think it's massive. Even little things I never used to do, like grounding. I, when people used to tell me this stuff, I'm like, you lot crazy. Like, come on, that, that, that don't work. And honestly, it, it's worked for me so much. Um, so yeah, for me, I don't know the true definition of success because there's so many different forms of it. But if my family can stay healthy, enjoy life, and I see them happy, realistically, that's, that's what it makes me happy most, really. So yeah. There you go. And that is not the end of this conversation because D did indeed stick around for about an extra 30 minutes doing a members only Q&A, speaking to some of the people who were there live in our Success School membership. Here is a little preview of the rest of this chat. When it comes to the crypto side of things, in terms of like strategy, what would you suggest? I've got like um, a bit of a, a property query. I live in Spain. From what I gather at the minute, anyway, it's Bitcoin and investing in businesses, right? From what I gather. So my question was, other than great cash flow and buying a business, is there any kind of like, have you got like a framework that you look for when you're going to potentially invest in a, in a new business? I want something that already has a good culture. I'm completely new to all of this. I want to understand more so I know then what to do moving forward like with investing in like whether it's bitcoin or crypto and all stuff like that like where yeah. would you recommend to to start so on crypto i would say there's um like for me being here with matt like putting yourself around positive people 
Like that's the start of all of this, right? Regardless of what it is you're doing, people and environment is pretty much like the pivotal foundation of it all, okay? Now, as always, if you want to access the rest of this conversation, all you need to do is sign up for your free trial into the Success School membership. The link is available right now. Wherever you listen to this podcast, it is there in the show notes. Um, click the link, sign up for free. You can join us on a 14-day trial. That's not only going to give you access to the rest of this conversation, but it's going to give you access to now nearly two years worth of bonus materials, um, which includes live coaching calls, which includes over 50 training videos on high-performance mindset and also business, sales, branding, marketing, and so much more. You'll also get access into our private community. We've got a WhatsApp uh, private group. And you will also be invited to all our upcoming podcast recordings so that on the next podcast episode, you're not just listening to it like once it's released. You can be there with us live on the podcast recording not just for the podcast interview, but also for the members Q&A. And I think this is a really important part of what the membership gives you. It means you can actually meet these guests yourself and ask your personal questions and get personalized, bespoke advice from our podcast guests. So that is a really huge part of the membership. As I say, it's completely free to join for two weeks. Click the link, sign up. It will ask for payment details just so that you set up a proper account, but it will not take any payment right now as there is still a free trial being offered. And if you like it, if you think it's valuable and you want to stick with us after the trial ends, it is only £19 per month to stay a member and you get all those members benefits. So I really, really hope you'll join us. Um, whether you join us in the membership as a paid member or not, I do hope, as I said at the beginning, you'll still stick around um, being a regular listener of this podcast. Please do. Please do me a favor. Hit that subscribers um, button. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platforms. That is also going to help us be able to grow. It's going to help us be able to therefore get even bigger, better guests and therefore be able to provide even bigger, better value for you the loyal listener. Thank you as always. Lots of love to you all for being here. And I'm going to finish this podcast as I always do with the Jim Rowan quote. Jim Rowan said that traditional education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. I'll see you soon.